Nu ska vi lyssna till en presentation. Det är en man som snart ska åka med ett flyg. Men först så ska han eh, prata om det mobila användandet och hur reglerna ändras för eh, just företag. 1993 eh, började magasin Wired ges ut. Det är ett amerikanskt magasin som skriver om hur ny teknologi påverkar vårt samhälle. Wired är känt för att mynta nya uttryck, bland annat The Long Tail, som vi har hört flera gånger här idag. Nu ska ni få träffa redaktören för den brittiska utgåvan. Han har skrivit krönikor för många magasin, bland annat The Times Magazine, The Guardian, The Times. Och han pratar ofta om hur entreprenörer och innovatörer förändrar världen. Nyligen så gjorde de en undersökning om de mest populära startupstäderna och där kom Stockholm på andra plats. Så vi hälsar. Uh, it's a great honor to welcome Mr. David Rowan to share his insights with us. Hello, yes, thank you. Hi Stockholm, forgive me for speaking English. It's just you have an education system that works and we don't. Um, Nice to be here, because we do celebrate in Wired Magazine Stockholm companies most months, I think. So I'm going to talk a little about not just where commerce is going, but why it's going mobile in a big way. And there are big opportunities if you can get in there now. Um, but first of all, I want to start looking into the future about how customer behavior is going to change. And I often look into the future by looking back at how we predicted the future in the past. So I'm going to show you an American corporate video from 1967 about what life would be way ahead in 1999 AD. Fingertip shopping will be one of the many homemaker's conveniences. This video console will be channeled into the store of her choice. There, a camera Ooh. Sorry. will scan a display of wares, which she will select by push button. Another part of this console is a household monitor screen, which maintains a watch on critical areas in the house, swimming pool, or yard. What the wife selects on her console will be paid for by the husband at his counterpart console. All bills and transactions will be carried out electronically. A central bank computer will debit the family's account the amount of purchases and credit the department store, for example, informing the family's home computer at the same time. Father, at the touch of a button, receives an instantaneous printed copy of his budget, the amount of taxes he owes, the payments left on the car, and so forth. All documents and household records are available on the video screen for immediate reference. Also at his disposal is an electronic correspondence machine, or home post office, which allows for instant written communication between individuals anywhere in the world. To maintain these and hundreds of complex electronic circuits, a monitor checks all circuits every few seconds, inserts a backup circuit if and when trouble develops, and alerts the communal service agency for replacement. If you ever heard of the cloud, that's what the cloud looks like. So what is fantastic, that's kind of 45 years ago, and they got it right. This is that device. So it's not the form of the technology, it's the way it simplifies getting to the things we want. It's that emotional validation from seeing the children. It's making your life easier by doing your shopping. And online is increasingly through this little device, which is emotional. You know, I never sleep more than a meter away from this. It's got my life on it. So I'm going to live by the philosophy, I think, of William Gibson, the science fiction writer, that there's no mystery about where the future is. You just look at what people are doing now on the edges. And if it's going to make your life easier, if it's going to help you express your identity, it's probably going to catch on. Um, but we're in a time of massive disruption, so nobody can relax. Nobody can be safe in knowing what you're doing today will still be your business in a week. Um, I started three years ago editing a paper magazine. I thought that's what I did, but it's not. I'm now 
trying to tell the stories, but through all sorts of devices, through you know, the tablet device, through the various apps. We're doing audio, we're doing podcast. We're now a live event, because that's how people want to access the stories and each other. Um, and in Condé Nast, where I work, some of the other magazines in Moscow, there's the Vogue Cafe, or there's the GQ Bar. Um, you've got to be careful about extending the brand too far. Cosmopolitan magazine became a yogurt a couple of years ago, which wasn't quite helpful. Um, but I just want to, to remember that film, The Graduate, and remember Mr. Maguire said to Benjamin, Benjamin, I've just got one word for you. It was plastic then, but now the word would be mobile, because pretty much everything is going mobile at such a mad pace. So we're officially no longer in the desktop era. The numbers say we're in the mobile era. Um, and in fact, it happened last spring when the number of mobile internet devices overtook desktop computers for the first time, way ahead of the predictions of the analysts. I'm going to give you a few, few numbers. You don't have to think this is school. But big growth opportunity, because many more people, three times as many, are on the mobile than on the desktop internet. But they're buying lots of smartphones, so they're getting the internet on the mobile device, many of them for the first time, particularly in Africa, in places like India. And we're changing our behavior on the mobile device. We're spending an awful lot of money. So PayPal recently said, 2009, mobile payments, $141 million. 2010, 750 million. Last year, $4 billion. And that's just one example of a trend which is rising exponentially. And just look at the number of mobile devices out there. Compared with in the 1990s, when there were maybe 100 million PCs, there's already more than 10 billion mobile devices, not just your phones and your tablets, but your gaming systems and your cars. Pretty much everything is connected. And we love these devices. We love especially the tablet devices. The speed of adoption is accelerating. The first 50 million tablet devices were bought within two years. Compare that with the laptop for 15 years. So something transformational is happening in our lifetime. And this will be the single biggest thing happening with technology, I think. So I'm not going to make you study the detail of this. This is just the processing power, the energy efficiency of computers. And it's kind of, it looks like a straight line, but it's actually an exponential curve. And what that is saying is, since the 1940s and 1950s, for the same amount of battery power, your device can do exponentially more. So the smartphone has the processing power of the rockets NASA sent to the moon. And we're just at the beginning. We're not even in the 3G world in most of the world. In the UK, we're still kind of halfway there. India barely at all. So if you weren't concentrating, that's the trend. This is where it leads to. This is no longer the richest man in the world. It's quite right that he's been overtaken by this man, who is Carlos Slim, who made his money through telecoms. OK, so you probably have heard of this buzzword, solo-mo. If you haven't, um, you need to know it. Solo-mo, invented by this man, John Deere, um, from the west coast of America venture capitalist, early investments in little tiny garage startups like Amazon and Google. And he will now only invest in companies that are social and local and mobile, because that's where he sees the consumer going. So for instance, social, companies that connect on Facebook with hundreds of thousands of users. This is a career recruitment service trying to take on LinkedIn. But what's interesting, when it launched through Facebook, massive growth in users. They spread the message virally. Retail, through the social graph, again, on Facebook, an outdoor gear company, made it very interactive way to share with your friends. Again, huge increase in traffic, but more than that, lots more people going to the cash register. So, you know, we'll think we know about social media. It makes the news. It's also changing how people are spending money. And it's still a bit of an experiment. These guys are pushing it. They see this as their way of supplanting the old idea of advertising. Mark Zuckerberg seems to think social commerce is going to be the next area to blow up. So people are experimenting. You had some um, stories about Pinterest earlier today. Again, this is the way for people to curate ideas together. And there's ways that people are inventing to turn that into retail. You just need to be creative. There's all sorts of stores like, or networks like this where you can aggregate and share content. People are doing this tremendous amounts, 
and you've just got to find a way of tapping in to make it easier for them to buy what they like. There's beautiful creative solutions to some of life's great problems. So you know that problem when you're in the changing room and you don't know whether to get the blue top or the red top and your partner's not there, what do you do? You take a photo, you upload it in real time to go try it on and the crowd tells you which looks better on you. That's science. So there's been some early experiments. You know, Levi's created a social store. You could see the jeans and the jackets that your friends like. You know, it's not the answer, but it's one of the potential solutions. Volkswagen, when they launched the um, GTI, they thought people buy a car partly based on what other people think about it. So they created a way to share on Facebook. Hey, give me feedback on my GTI. You can customize it on the website. And they had half a million people going through that process. And many of them took test rides, which is a sign that they're going to buy. And travel. To to beach have a look at what's happening in travel. Went, you won't shut up about how great it is. But here's what happens when I research Beachtown on the travel sites. Hundreds of hotel links and reviews, and I still know basically nothing about Beachtown because I don't know who to listen to. So here's what I do instead. I go to Trippy and I start a new trip. I say where I'm going and what I'm looking for, and Trippy ties into my Facebook and other places to find my friends who can help. Oh look, Donnie went to school in Beachtown, and Mikey just checked in there last week. And of course, I know how much Katie loves Beachtown. Hey, all right. Sweetie, what was the name of that beautiful resort we stayed at? Sea... Seashells. Seashells. Donnie says I should stay at Seashells, and some of my other friends seem to agree. So I click Add to Trip, and I can book it right from Trippy. Ooh, luxurious. I can't wait to stay there. Oh, and I know how you love shrimp tacos. You have to go to Sandy's. Um, yes, please. Oh, that is amazing. When I'm on my trip, I can use the Trippy app to capture it all in my album and share it with the people that made my trip great. Hey, all right. This trip is shaping up to be incredible. And if any of my friends are dreaming of a trip like this, it's real easy to copy it for themselves. Oh, and you can't leave without taking your picture at Cappy's Bluff. It's sort of a tradition. Okay, I'll do it. Cappy's Bluff. All you have to realize is most of Daisy's friends are unemployed. But the point is that we're sharing, and we're encouraging people to buy things, and we trust our friends, and these things are really useful. So there's all sorts of estimates about the value of social commerce, but it's still kind of year zero. So you know, this is your business to create, I think. So the other thing that's happening is the consumer is giving you endless amounts of data, and it helps you customize what you're offering. So you can get a one terabyte, 1,024 gigabytes of storage now for, for nothing. So I bought one like this for 50 pounds, 500 kroner. Um, and I thought I'd never fill it. I thought this is going to be me for the next 10 years. But you change your behavior. You never delete anything. You keep backups of movies, your voicemail and everything. And that's because the price of storage has gone to zero. So Eric Schmidt of Google said a while ago that in the whole of human civilization up until 2003, collectively, people maybe stored five exabytes, five billion gigabytes of data. But now, he said, we're producing that much every two days and it's accelerating. So that's every streamed video, every Skype call. But if you can use that data, if you can tap into it with smart software, you can solve problems, problems we didn't think we had. So a couple of examples of problems people are solving. You know when you take family photos or videos, you go on vacation, and it's left stored on your computer because nobody's got time to edit, and nobody's really very good at editing. So this Israeli company decided to create an algorithm that intelligently edited your video for you. This is an example. So it's a half hour video they reduced to just a couple of minutes and they track faces, they track where the camera's pointing, so that must be an important person. They track what they think is important dialogue. It's a company called Magisto, but it's just you know one example of what is possible. Um, so it's about being creative, trying to find solutions. So if our devices connected to the internet, connected to GPS, um, are with us all the time, maybe there could be other problems we solve. So 
if anybody here has asthma, you'll know that you can't always predict where it hits. So this is what a bunch of American doctors have been doing. Each day, millions of Americans carry and use inhalers to relieve asthma symptoms. How often a person uses their inhaler indicates how well their disease is managed. The Spiroscout is a small device that attaches easily to most inhalers. It uses GPS to automatically determine the exact time and location when the inhaler is used, because revealing where people use their inhalers provides valuable clues about environmental exposures that cause attacks. Our tools help patients, physicians, and public health agencies systematically track asthma in real time so that they can put the latest information to work to better understand and control the disease. So in an always connected world, what other problems can we solve? Um, so we're giving data to the machine in all sorts of other ways as well, not just through our devices. So now for $100, $200, you can go to this California company, 23andMe, and they will send you this little plastic tube, and you spit into it, and you send it back, and four or five weeks later, you get your own personal web pages with a detailed breakdown of your DNA, and your risk factor for maybe 50 illnesses, a map showing where your parents' genotype originated, your likelihood for you know, going bald, your reaction to things. But what's interesting is you also get your own inbox, and it will tell you, for instance, David, we have 828 of your cousins in our network, and it breaks it down into second cousins and third cousins, and you start getting emails in the system like this one. Hello, my name's Alison. I'm contacting you because we share 0.62% DNA on six strands. <laughs> we could be cousins. Do you want to be friends? Um, I'm sorry, Alison, I just got all these other emails I haven't dealt with yet. I can't do the DNA social network. But you know, you see where it's going. So physical and digital are being connected um, very quickly because sensors are becoming incredibly cheap and they're being connected to all sorts of things. We're going to be wearing sensors, monitoring our blood sugar levels, our blood pressure and so on. Um, and already creative uses of these sensors are improving our lives. So in San Francisco, there are sensors on the pavement underneath where cars could be parking. And you can tell in real time through a Google map where there is a free parking space. Again, it's just one creative use. There'll be millions more. So I'm wearing, this is the Nike band. This is Jawbone's equivalent. They tell you how far you've walked. They tell you how many calories you've burned. They create a kind of competition with yourself and with other people you share this data with online. So it's behavior changing. Um, so we've been playing around with augmented reality. You can point your phone. It takes data from GPS coordinates and imposes in this case, airplanes in the sky, how far away from you they are, where they're going. Terrorist dream, according to some tabloid newspapers. I, I figure if you've got terrorists kind of doing this, they're not going to win. My favorite um, example through one of these augmented reality platforms, Leia. If you're in Berlin, you go to where the Berlin Wall used to be, you hold your camera up, and you can see what it would have looked like, solving other problems. So there's commercial applications, obviously, you know, sell something to somebody where they are, and it's worth trying. There's also all sorts of other business opportunities. So there's a London company that's got this geolocation app called Badu, where you can meet people nearby and do whatever you want with them. You can decide, you know, I want to meet somebody 50 meters away, 100 meters away. It's a hookup app. Um, 150 million members making hundreds of millions of euros a year because people pay to rise to the top of the search results. So I think we should stop talking about the internet as the thing that you go to the device to access. It's more like electricity, it's like air, it's the hypernet, um, a term coined by um, investor Mike Maples and Roger McNamee. And their idea of the hypernet is it's kind of the internet plus mobile plus Wi-Fi, it's the stuff that's blanketing us. And that, again, is changing behavior. And this is Google's view. You'll be wearing glasses, according to Google, which are always connected. Hmm. Yeah. Um, meet me in front of Strand Books at two.
Oh man, really? Hey there, guy. Hey there, little guy. Sweet. Remind me to buy tickets for Monsieur Gano tonight. Where's the music section? So you think it's sci-fi, but Google's just got permission to drive uh, driverless oh, yeah. cars around this California. You just got to think how quickly Ball we've adapted yet? to things like Siri talking to the machine. It's quite a fun time we live in, huh? So everything, if not now, very soon is connected. What does that mean for retail? This is Tesco. Tesco has been evolving itself, adjusting to the local market. It even changed the name itself from Tesco to Home Plus. This is in Korea. And at last, it grew to rank number two in Korea. But Tesco had to overcome one obstacle, a fewer number of stores compared to the number one company, Emart. Mission, could we become number one without increasing the number of stores? We made an in-depth study into Koreans once more. Koreans are the second most hardworking people in the world. For them, Grocery shopping once a week is a dreaded task. So we decided to approach these busy and tired people. Idea. Let the store come to the people. We created virtual stores, hoping to blend into people's everyday lives. Our first try was subway stations. Although virtual, the displays were exactly the same as actual stores. From the display, to the merchandise. Only one thing was different. You use smartphones to shop. Scan the QR code with your phone and the product automatically lands in your online cart. When the online purchase is done, it will be delivered to your door right after you get home. People can relax more after work and on weekends. It put them at number one. Again, it's making people's lives easier. So the crowd is more powerful than any of us, any of our businesses. Um, but that again creates opportunities once you understand it. If you ever go to Kickstarter, it's a fantastic, not just real-time market test, R&D focus group, but it's also changing how real products are designed and made and sold. So there's one online at the moment. This is a snapshot of today on Kickstarter. Um, it's a watch. It's a prototype watch with an electronic paper screen so you can choose whether it displays images, whether it syncs by Bluetooth to your device. And they thought if we make $100,000 in pledges, we can go into manufacture. So there's still nine days to go and 64,000 people have pledged $10 million. It's extraordinary. The people decide. The people are also making a car. So there's a company in the States called Local Motors where the crowd votes up the designs of a car and they actually make it. This is their rally car. You can have one for about $50,000 and they'll help you manufacture it over a couple of weekends, but they'll get all the parts. It's changing education, so the crowd, anybody, can be a university. Salman Khan put some videos explaining some science online for young relatives. This morning, there were 150 million views already of those lessons, and they're pretty basic, they're pretty amateur. So now some real professors at Stanford are doing the same. They've created Udacity, teaching at the moment there's an artificial intelligence course online free, and there's people all over the world playing, joining in, pursuing the course. Hundreds of thousands of people are doing this. And then there's also people selling their services by the hour. If you have a skill somebody else needs, TaskRabbit in the US will allow you to price your skill. Guess what the most commonly asked for skill is that people will pay for? Anybody guess? Putting up IKEA furniture. <laughs> so the same disruption 
is happening even to the banks. So in Kenya, peer-to-peer -peer money transfer system through a basic cell phone, it's called M-Pesa, it's now accounting for about 25% of all the money going through the Kenyan economy. Money transfer, there's now a startup in London, transfer-wise, where you don't have to pay big bank fees. It's just a couple of pounds. If you have euros, somebody else wants krona. You do a deal. Peer-to-peer -peer lending through businesses like this one. You set the interest rate that you're willing to lend for. What's interesting is the default rate is very low. It's about 1%, which is way lower than maybe the 8 or 9% the credit card companies have. So let me big up a Stockholm company, iZettle, again, taking on this market with the device that allows anybody to take plastic. Just like in the States, Jack Dorsey's Square is doing a similar thing. The rules are being reinvented as we speak. So it makes a bit of sense now we think about it that Facebook paid a billion dollars last month for Instagram. Because if you look at the small print on their IPO prospectus, Mr. Zuckerberg says, we don't currently generate any meaningful revenue through our Facebook mobile products. Our ability to do so successfully is unproven. But of course, what does this give them? More reason for people to use their mobile device and to share. So I was talking to the um, founder of Net-A-Porter, the British e-commerce fashion site on Thursday. Um, and she said something that really kind of shook me a bit. I didn't realize it had got this far. She said, at the moment, 20% of their sales are through mobile devices, increasingly tablets. But by next year, they think it will be 50%. And then by the end of the decade, the desktop will be history. People are spending money late at night. They're sitting on the sofa. They're sitting in bed. It's easier. But one thing I'd like you to go away with is um, we don't have all the answers. And even what we think are the answers are probably not the answers. But the internet gives us a wonderful way in real time to test. It's A-B testing. You put two different variables live and see what people do. And you can do this. Social gaming companies like Wooga in Berlin are doing this hundreds of times a day, changing how fast a character moves, changing the colors of the background to see what people engage with most. And I think all of you should be thinking about how you can A-B test your home pages your offers, even pricing. Um, I'll just give you one example. So the last American election, the Obama campaign, decided to test their sign-up page on the website. And they changed a few things. The, the media, it's either photos or videos, and the button. Should it say sign up? Should it say join now? And that was the original one. They had 24 variables. This is the one they ended up with, based on people clicking through. They did 13,000 people. And do you know what? The click-through rate between those two went up from 8.26 to 11.6. And they calculated that the impact of using the second one over the first one brought them an extra $60 million in donations. So you've got to test. They didn't know what would have worked. In fact, there's a famous example of, you remember Van Halen had this really, really annoying concert rider when they played that they wanted a bowl of M&Ms in their room but there couldn't be brown ones. This is the concert rider. Well, that was A-B testing. That was to see if the people running the show, they had very complicated stage equipment, were reading the small print. And if they saw a brown M&M, &M, they had that feedback loop. They knew they weren't being careful. So often they'd refuse to play because there were big safety implications. So we're in a world of um, transparency, and again, the idea of privacy as we used to know it is probably finished. Um, but it also means that you can kind of change other people's behavior. Um, so in New York now, you can go to online maps showing how much energy each individual building is used, is using. Um, and that creates a kind of peer pressure that you don't want to be shamed by your neighbors. But we are still human beings with our psychological flaws and weaknesses. And um, we do strange things like pay 635,000 real American dollars for this virtual nightclub in a virtual asteroid called Project Entropia. 
last year. And we do strange things like this is a, a free smartphone game called um, Mini Tycoon, but you can pay a little bit of money to customize your corner of the casino. And Shervin Pesheva, the um, guy who founded this company, told me one woman had just paid $40,000 of real money to customize her little corner of the casino. Um, because we care about mad things like our online reputation score through services like Clout, based on who's retweeting you, how influential they are, and so on. Um, but it's connecting into the real world now. It's not just a, a mad fantasy obsession. So in um, New York, they had a fashion week party at this place where you had to have a Clout score above 40 to get in. And I think there will be a new kind of reputational currency which will in fact impact everything. Maybe clout's not the one, but somehow we'll find a way, like your eBay feedback, um, to create a common currency that will affect everything from you know, how you get bank credit to who's gonna follow you. Gaming, gamifying, using this psychology um, is hitting all sorts of commercial op 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 opportunities. Um, and I think it's worth looking into. I'll just give you a couple of examples. So the dashboard of the Prius turns saving energy, turns braking efficiently into a game. And you can compare this with other people. Um, there's energy bills produced by this company called Opower, which does a little visual, compares your energy consumption with not just your neighbors, but your efficient neighbors. And the people who get these kinds of bills typically use 3% less energy than the people who get the ordinary bills. So I just want to th think about the sorts of crazy psychological stuff we are doing online. Um, so if real life were like Facebook, if we behaved in the same way, how weird would it be? Hi, guys. Um, can, I, can I be your friend? Um, can, I, can I write on your wall? No. Will you be my friend? Hmm? But I, I write on all my friends' walls. I think I'd have to know you before I was your friend. All my friends have got like 180 friends. I've only got two. Yeah? Would it help if maybe like you looked at my photos? No, that one's uh, with two like really pretty girls. Like, you know, that's my ex. You know, I was in a relationship with her, but, you know, I've changed my status now. Okay. Yeah. What's your relationship status? Um, single. Oh, good. Yeah. Cool. I like that. Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. I like your jacket. Thank you. I like your sunglasses. Strange. Do you like that? Yeah. Do you want to comment on it? <laughs> it's actually a trailer for an opera by the English National Opera, but um, I don't think we quite got the etiquette of this social media. We're still in the early years. So the idea of you know, the technology that we use, the technology layer is disappearing as well. Um, we're just going to interact directly with the services. So there's all sorts of things happening. This is um, American research where you can actually read people's brain signals to reconstruct images based on what they're thinking. There's a nice local company called Toby, whose representatives may be here. We've done some work with eye tracking but also embedding eye-tracking cameras into a laptop so you can navigate just by looking, no mouse, no hand. Fun experience, slightly odd. And of course, there's the Kinect sensor that puts you into the picture. You are the controller. It's all sorts of extra applications. Um, so think about this as the beginning of a hugely disruptive time, a mobile and a social and a local time that Douglas Adams, um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy writer, might kind of spur you on to react to quite quickly, because he said, um, anything invented before you're 15, that's the order of nature. It's always been like that. Anything invented between your 15th and 35th birthday, you know, you could get some career benefit there. But anything invented after you're 35 is against nature and should be prohibited. So I'm not going to ask how old anybody is, but I would talk to the 15-year-olds and talk to the interns because the accelerated pace of um, change is extraordinary, and I don't think any of us can keep still. So even while I've been standing here, 10 million minutes of Skype calls and half a million 
iPhone apps downloaded. Thank you. David, you are in a real hurry. I have an airplane. <laughs> but I can answer one quick question if yeah. you want. Any questions? Um, uh, one question, question from Twitter. Uh, what's the biggest challenge for social commerce? Finding a model that works, because I think there's been a lot of attempts <coughs> that haven't yet delivered. Um, so it's clear that our social networks influence our tastes. And, you know, if I think about my behavior, I will buy a product, a light, a piece of music, if somebody I respect says they've bought it and they like it. Um, but we haven't yet discovered a very smooth process for doing this. And I think um, that's going to evolve in the next year, maybe two years. And whoever cracks that, especially with broadcasting, you can create the screen that allows you to not just have a conversation about the products, the programs, but also maybe find out more about the products, buy tickets for things. Then there's you know, billions up for grabs. But maybe somebody here will solve that. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thanks for having me. And a me. safe journey home. Thanks. Good luck.